All right, this is the last video of week two. You're almost there. So we're going to be talking now about the actual concept of structural injustice, and then you're going to have an exercise where you apply that back to the story of Henrietta Lacks. Okay, so you just did an exercise on Lorain County Community College as a social structure. I imagine that you gave answers that are something like this. When you talk about roles, the roles involved with um, a, a college are primarily student and teacher, right? Those are the first, the, 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 that's really the core of the relationship. Um, you also have to think about the staff, the administrators, the president, the members of the board of governors, um, and there are relationships between all of these, right? Um, so there are actually a lot of different roles involved with LCC as a s social structure. You might also actually just want to include the taxpayers of Lorain County. Um, that's a role. Okay. If you're in these roles, you have certain routines. You enroll in classes, you pay tuition, you attend class, you receive a grade, you graduate. The campus has certain resources, physical structures. There's a, there used to be a build, there's a campus with buildings and computers, and maybe one day I'll return to that. Um, there's a budget, 65 million a year. Um, that's the operating budget. Most of that comes from government, not uh, uh, only like a third, less than a third of it comes from uh, what you guys pay tuition. Okay. Within these roles, you have certain opportunities. Graduates get jobs and economic, uh, socioeconomic mobility. The community gets people who can fill jobs and function in society. And sometimes, sometimes, people actually learn things. At the same time, once you have these opportunities, um, you'll also have all sorts of constraints. Students will owe money. Students are expected to owe, uh, to do coursework. The community pays taxes. But nevertheless, people somehow manage to come to college every day and fulfill their roles. So there are habits that are set up. And you know, when we have in-person classes, people will sit in the same chair they did the first day of class. Again, these habits um, allow the structure to continue, the social structure. And their expectations. Employers expect that graduates will be responsible. Good employees. Graduates expect that employers will expect that they are responsible. The college expects tax money, all of this stuff. So all of those elements come together and they create Lorain County Community College as a social structure, right? Um, these elements constitute historical givens in relation to which individuals act and are relatively stable over time. That is, college was, the college was just here when you came. It is, in that sense, a historical given. It's stable over time. It hasn't much changed. Even under coronavirus, it's still functioning in much the same way that it always has. So, Young makes a note. I chose not to call the, the social relationships that result in a lack of decent affordable housing a system because, I can, because that connotes a more bounded entity that I believe corresponds to the social reality that we are trying to describe. So she doesn't talk about social systems, um, and that's because systems imply degree of organization and, well, boundedness is her word, that isn't really here. Things are much more messy than that. It is misleading, however, to reify the metaphor of a structure. So 
reify means turn into a concrete object. Don't, I just told you how to think about a, a, a structure, but don't think about it as a thing that you might just find in the world. I know the college you, it was here when you came here, but it wasn't just sitting there. It was here because it was being created constantly. So what Jung says is we should not think of social structures as entities independent of social actors lying passively around uh, for them, easing or inhabiting their movement, um, easing or inhibiting their movement. On the contrary, social structures exist only in action and the interaction of persons. They exist not as states, but as processes. This college was here when you came here, but not as a static object. It was here because people were constantly recreating it. People were fulfilling all of the social roles that I had been, we had been talking about, following those habits, fulfilling those expectations. So now at last, long last, we can get to the idea of a structural injustice. So this is how Jung defines a structural injustice. Structural injustices are harms that come to people as a result of pro structural processes in which many people participate. All right, I have a slight quibble here with the word harm. Uh, because I don't think any har all harms count as an injustice. Think about a surgeon, right? A surgeon cuts into you, and in a sense, your body is harmed. But it's justified because ultimately the surgeon uh, is doing a good to you. So I don't think all harms are injustices. Um, I think that we can just define injustice in general the way Aristotle does, as um, fairness, treating similar cases similarly. And then we can say structural injustices are injustices, those particular set of injustices, that come to people as a result, uh, uh, as a result of structural processes in which many participate. All right. So... We now have an idea of a structural injustice. Um, one, of the, one important thing to see, and the thing that is ultimately Young's point in her essay, is that when you're dealing with structural injustice, you need to treat the idea of responsibility differently. So she talks about the limitations of something that she calls the liability model of responsibility. And essentially, I was asking you to use the liability model of responsibility in the last exercise in week one, where I asked you to name all the people who contributed to um, an action, in this case, an eviction, and then decide whether they were acting voluntarily, and decide whether they were breaking the rule. Working uh, across individuals like that is, a, is the liability way of approaching responsibility. So liability, the liability model of responsibility says you must be causally connected to a harm to be responsible for it. That's why at the beginning of that exercise, I had you look at all of the factors that caused the, an eviction, like children throwing snowballs or a guy jumping out of his car and breaking a lock, right? The other thing is that everything that happens is backwards looking. After the eviction occurs, you can think about how you can um, assign responsibility for what has already happened. This approach to responsibility is indispensable for the legal system. Law always works this way, um, and that's important that it does. We need to assign responsibility to individuals 
for the things they caused. Um, and Young goes off here about the difference between fault liability and strict liability, but we don't need to worry about this. The thing is, the liability response model it, on its own is not enough to understand all of our responsibilities. So why is that? Well, Young has an argument. The problems we face are large-scale structural problems, often global in scale, right? Global warming is a structural problem that involves all 7 billion inhabitants of the Earth. And if you just look at the liability model of responsibility, you're not going to be able to um, understand our responsibility for global warming because we each contribute indirectly and so little. The liability model of responsibility was really meant to work on a small scale. Um, it is a notion of justice that evolved, if I can get evolutionary for a second here. It's the notion of justice that made sense when human beings were all hunter-gatherers or living in very small-scale agrarian communities where everyone basically knew each other. You know, you're looking at 150, 250, maybe 500 people, right? That's the model of responsibility that, 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 uh, that is the environment where the liability model of responsibility evolved. Now that we're dealing with huge social structures, we need an, an additional conception of responsibility that connects individuals to those structures. So, premise one, we face global problems. Premise two, the liability model was meant to deal with small problems. Conclusion, we need an additional conception of responsibility to deal with the global problems. And so this is where she introduces the idea of political responsibility. Political responsibility does not try to isolate some responsible parties in order to absolve others. We're not saying you're responsible and you're not, right? Um, everyone who is involved with a social structure is responsible. The liability model of responsibility um, seeks a remedy for a uh, deviation from an acceptable norm, right? That is, it's all ultimately about rectifying justice in Aristotle's terms. Political responsibility is ultimately about uh, distributive justice. So we can talk about justice in, a, um, in the ordinary workings of society, and we talk about political responsibility in, in that context. So political responsibility is forward-looking rather than backward-looking. Rather than figuring out what went wrong, who to blame, and who to punish, we look forward and see how we can make the society we live in more just. Um, assigning responsibility is more discretionary here. Um, a judge in looking at using liability responsibility for uh, rectifying justice has to follow some strict rules. If we're forward-looking, we can decide how we think it's going to be best for us personally to contribute to um, the cause of justice. Um, and political responsibility is a shared responsibility. We share it with others whose actions contribute to the structural processes that produce the injustice. So everyone who is involved with the structural process is equally involved, is, is equally responsible for changing that injustice. All right, so that's the idea of a structural injustice. It is an injustice that many people work together to create. And so um, it's meant to contrast with notions of implicit bias or conscious prejudice, which are individual actions.
So uh, the last thing you have to do for this week is apply those, the, the, these concepts to some situations in Henrietta Lacks. So I've got an exercise where you have to define some terms um, just to see if you've got down what we were just talking about. And then I'm gonna, I list a few situations from Henrietta Lacks and you have to decide whether they are examples of a structural injustice or an individual bias.